We'll have concrete go head to head with wood in the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love that. What I often say is that a code compliant building is the worst building that you can legally build. You've got to meet the code. That's the, that's the lowest common denominator. We can do a better job and keep people safer without spending more money. Often we don't stretch uh, to try to reach anything above and beyond. Resilience matters. I'm Greg Lewis, Executive Vice President with the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. Wanted to chat with you today about the Build with Strength program, an initiative formed by the National Ready Mix Concrete Association to bring building better, safer, more resilient, and more energy efficient and sustainable structures using concrete. NRMCA is the, the concrete mixer truck that you see driving down the road with the drum on the back that rotates. That's ready mixed concrete. The Build with Strength program is really focused on helping folks in the housing sector, whether they be architects, developers, contractors, to be understand the options that are available to them. My own background, I'm an architect. I've spent a lot of time working on projects in the private sector. And as part of my, my tenure with AECOM, I served for a year in Haiti after the earthquake, where we did the design work to reconstruct the healthcare infrastructure, which was decimated uh, because of uh, poor building uh, codes. What brought me to the concrete industry was that resilience matters. What I often say is that a code compliant building is the worst building that you can legally build. You've got to meet the code. That's the, that's the lowest common denominator. We have seen over and over again across the U.S. because of the way the code system works here, uh, buildings that aren't performing the way that they could if we simply tried to improve our uh, code system. The American Society of Civil Engineers, even very recently, given the infrastructure in the United States, a, a, like a D minus grade. We've got issues in this country around infrastructure that need to be addressed. The coastal communities have really gotten hammered from storms. These are examples of homes that were built to a building code and were essentially decimated. If we're going to develop in areas that might have weather conditions that could be problematic for, for the building infrastructure in that community, the way that those codes are developed need to be uh, done so in such a way that we're actually able to eliminate or dramatically reduce the adverse impacts of a severe event like a superstorm. The building codes, themselves are there to protect human life. Essentially what you end up with are building codes that are designed around the idea that you need to have a certain amount of time to get out of a building in a severe situation. If the building burns down or washes away, the insurance company is going to pay to rebuild it, right? And that's part of the calculated risk of whatever the uh, scenario is, whether it's a hurricane or a building fire or wildfire. We're essentially trying to find the balance between how much we're willing to spend to protect a human life. Truth is that we can do that without necessarily adding significant cost uh, to each one of these projects. There is not a correlation between affordability and safety. If you're gonna build a building six stories tall, you want to make sure that that building at least has fire separation within the building. Sprinklers are, a, are an active system. Firewalls are a passive system that works regardless of what the site conditions might be. We can do a better job and keep people safer without spending more money to accomplish the very goals that we all share. If we're going to put 100 or 500 human beings in a building and, and set them in there for the night to go to sleep, that we've considered the safety proposition uh, in, in a, I think, a more meaningful way than what is the lowest common denominator. Cheap construction, well, that's become acceptable uh, in, in some places around the, around the country. We'll have concrete go head to head with wood in the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would love that. Concrete offers a whole host of advantages from a safety and performance standpoint. Concrete is always local. If you're going to put concrete on a job, it's going to come from a batch plant within a very small uh, radius or distance from that job site. Uh, things like speed of construction, ease of use uh, in terms of the building construction itself, energy efficiency. It's never been a more cost-effective time to build with concrete. Now, wood frame prices are at historic highs, and 
Uh, but but there was a cost competitive argument to be made previously as well. Cost comparison here between two identical buildings, right? Four story, 100,000 square foot building, comparing a combustible versus a non-combustible cost of construction. They're very, very close. This comparison, if it were done today, would show the non-combustible probably 10% or more. So over time, you end up with potential on the same four-story, 100,000 square foot building of an increase in NOI of $188,000. The insurance company has a lower liability with non-combustible construction can reduce a turnover. Uh, the number one reason tenants move out of an apartment building is noise. <laughs> and the so-called STC rating of those demising walls, you're going to have a more stable tenant population and you won't be constantly paying to clean up that apartment for the next tenant. To get to true net zero, we want to provide the highest performing envelope that we can to heat or cool a building or buildings uh, with renewables. But in order to make that uh, as affordable as possible, you want to have the highest performing envelope possible. Building an envelope that's airtight, mass wall, and ultimately a high R value is going to help you to deliver that. The best way to do that is with a mass wall. And the most cost-effective way to do that is with a mass wall rather than a cavity wall. This is, this is all constructed with insulated concrete forms. The passive house standard was essentially met, at least as far as the building envelope is concerned, with an off-the-shelf ICF a product. To achieve those same standards with a cavity wall structure would require an amazing amount of detailing and very careful oversight of the way that envelope is being constructed. How does this uh, ICF panel work? This is ready-mixed concrete uh, as opposed to precast concrete. These are really just virtually uh, like Lego blocks. They're very lightweight, they're obviously mostly air, uh, entrained in a, a EPS foam system, and they're stacked together just like Legos. And when they get the wall up to the height of the next floor, they're braced, uh, and then the concrete is pumped into that wall cavity and allowed to set usually a very short period of time. And then the, the contractor can go on and put the next floor plate on. But this, this build goes, they go very, very fast and they provide a contact point for drywall or for brick ties or whatever other attachments need to be made on the inside or the outside of the building. So the ICFs are um, used both for exterior walls, demising walls, corridor walls, um, typically not for partition walls. It virtually eliminates air infiltration, which provides the, the building with the best possible scenario to dramatically reduce or completely eliminate the need for mechanical uh, heating or cooling in that structure. Concrete examples. There are a couple that are interesting. This is a case, uh, Drury Inn or Drury Hotels, where all they are now building are concrete and ICF uh, hotels. And there are a number of reasons for that. The number one reason is because the second highest cost that a hotel operator pays beyond their staff are their utilities, right? Keeping the buildings comfortable. And so having a building that performs exceedingly well in terms of minimizing costs is going to deliver long-term value for a hotel owner and operator. The, the Arlington, Virginia uh, their elementary schools, you can see the, the energy use for each of the elementary schools in that school district. And the one that they just finished there a couple of years ago called Discovery is a net zero energy school. And you can see those, uh, the red line is uh, the, was the most recent at the time uh, energy data for uh, 2017. Uh, this is a dormitory project in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, these are all affordable housing projects in New York City and are all ICF in concrete, meeting the HUD requirements and, and delivering energy savings there. Ontario, 315,000 square feet, reduced heating and cooling loads by 75%. You know, the, fu the future of concrete, just sort of touching on or highlighting a few areas of where Maybe it's driving down the carbon footprint, addressing some of those criticisms. Yeah, sheer volume of concrete that's used around the world is part of the reason it's, I think, in some ways received unfair rap about how much carbon is emitted. I think if you are using anything uh, in the marketplace, if the volumes that you're we're currently using concrete, you're going to have similar kinds of issues with whatever those things are. 
the carbon impacts, the greenhouse gas emissions impacts of the built environment is something that we should take very seriously. There are a whole host of innovators out there uh, working in this space. Uh, carbon Cure and Carbon Built were the co-winners of the Carbon X Prize uh, to further develop their technologies and implement those technologies that are essentially ways to, to uh, capture carbon and store it permanently in, in concrete mixes. There are a bunch of companies out there right now that are really, really turning up the, uh, the heat to address this problem. Blue Planet, Solidia Technologies, many of the major cement and concrete manufacturers are making investments in these and other companies with the expectation because of the early successes that they've seen that we can dramatically drive down uh, the carbon impacts of, of concrete. We're actually in the process right now of preparing to launch a couple of buildings uh, that we're expecting to see built uh, within the next 12 months that are going to be carbon positive concrete structures, admixtures, and a whole host of other uh, new approaches to the way this is being done. Portland Limestone Cement uh, is one of the, the products that's in the marketplace right now that immediately reduces the embodied carbon by 10% in the mix design. And when you start to layer some of these other innovations on top of a Portland limestone cement solution, what you're gonna see here, I, I fully anticipate in the next five years, maybe less, is that concrete will, will become the go-to for a place to store anthropogenic carbon uh, in the built environment. That if you have that quantity of material being placed on an annual basis, and you found out a way through innovation to use that as a place to store atmospheric carbon, well, now you've got the solution to address this, uh, this climate issue and, and challenge that we have. This large upfront carbon footprint, what's, what's driving the carbon footprint the most? It's the energy used to heat kilns to create that a clinker, and that that is the upstream uh, component of the concrete that is where a lot of that embodied energy is coming from. And that cement is therefore turned into mix that ultimately becomes concrete. So finding a way to be more efficient in the way that clinker is produced as it relates back to the final product, which is concrete. As far as the other components of a cement or concrete mix, you can put like recycled plastic into the mix or what other ingredients could be swapped in and out of this recipe to make it more sustainable or, or lower carbon footprint? For many that have been used for a very long time. So the two principal supplemental cementitious materials that are being used currently and have been for, for a long period of time are uh, fly ash and slag. And fly ash is a waste product from the production of coal-fired power plants. And that waste product can be brought into uh, and, and put into a mix design and can offset the, the use of, of cement. It's a supplementary uh, material. And slag is similar in that it is a byproduct of uh, steel manufacturing, and that also can be used as a SCM in the production of concrete. Innovation in concrete, the folks that are testing different concrete mixes uh, have been refining their craft uh, for eons. Well, Greg, I appreciate the discussion here. Appreciate the time.